almost 100 years after the Constitution went into effect. So from 1790 until 1868, so 78 years. Right? So for 78 years, there was a different understanding of who is a citizen of the United States. But the 14th Amendment clarifies that. Do you know the context for the, when the 14th Amendment came about? What was going on in the United States in 1868? 1868. 1868. Long ass time ago, excuse me. Long time ago. <laughs> so it was, it was a period called Reconstruction. Do you know what Reconstruction was? Okay, that rings a bell, good, all right. So, so Reconstruction was the period after the Civil War. And one of the things the Civil War accomplished was it ended slavery. But there were a lot of unanswered questions after the Civil War was over. Right? Perhaps most important among them was, okay, now that slavery's over, what is the status of all the people who used to be slaves? Right? because they're no longer slaves. That's done by the 13th Amendment, which was one before this one, right? Slavery's over. But the people who used to be slaves, what are they now? And that was very much an open question. And that was the source of a great deal of conflict and literal violence in some cases. Um, and the 14th Amendment, what it does is it, dis it establishes that yes, the people who used to be slaves are now, in fact, citizens of the United States. And they therefore deserve the equal protection of all the laws. Um, I think it's very fair to say that um, the United States did not live up to that for the former slaves. Because as Reconstruction went on, the idea that all citizens deserve equal protection of the laws, that all citizens cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, I think that was a promise that was broken over and over and over and over. Uh, brutally in some cases. But yet that is the bar of citizenship that we have. If you're born in the United States, you are a citizen of the United States. Um, and it does not matter if your parents are not citizens. Right? Anybody born inside the United States, any territory of the United States is a citizen of the United States, regardless of their parents' status. Now there is one loophole to that, and if you look here, it says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. So that kind of creates two categories, born in the United States, subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. The vast majority of people are both of those things. If you're born in the United States, you're subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Can you think of when would somebody be born in the United States, but not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. This is a edge case. It is a historical edge case, which can be sometimes fun to explore if you are a nerd of history and law. Diplomats, visiting diplomats have something called diplomatic immunity. So if you're an official envoy of a different country and you come to the United States, you are actually not subject to all the laws of the United States because of certain diplomatic immunities. Therefore, what this means is the one situation in which a person may be born in the United States but not actually be a citizen of the United States automatically is if their parents, both parents, are here as diplomats of a foreign country. But, you know, in the last 150 years, the number of people who have been born into that circumstance is probably very, very few. So all citizens of the United States deserve equal protection of the laws and due process under the law. Okay. Um, now, of course, I think that one of the most important duties of a citizen is to register to vote. Okay. And registering to vote is very, very easy these days, in part because of thanks to the internet. As you'll see in my talk, the internet is both a hero and a villain a little bit. There's some great things about the internet. There's some bad things about the internet. One of the good things about the internet is the fact that it makes voting registration so very easy. So if I simply go, oops, if I go to this website, it makes it really, really easy 
to check your voter registration or to register to vote if you're not already registered. Okay? Um, for example, we'll use me as a case. If you just simply go to vote.org, I can check my voter registration. And I'm about to divulge my home address, but I don't care. If you want to come, if you want to send me a, a, a Valentine card, be my guest. So it's as simple as typing in my name, my street address. Oops. Except you've got to do the drop down menu for that. You got a, my birth date, September 25. 83, where's my 83? And my email address. And my cell phone number. That is actually not required because there's not a red asterisk, so I'll just skip that part. Boom. Check my address. Boom. I'm registered to vote. Right? And so for people who are just about to graduate college, what could often happen is you move around, right? You're living in one town because you're going to college there. You might get a job someplace else. You might go back to your hometown. Um, that can sometimes make people wonder, well, what is my voting registration status? You simply type in the address at which you think you might be registered. Boom, you check your voter registration. If you're not registered to vote, um, that's a different process. Go back to the main website. You'll enter your name, you'll enter your address and everything, and then it'll figure out, okay, Missouri, you, your, your home address is Missouri, it'll take you through the process of registering to vote in Missouri. Now, now when we think about voting, we often think about um, national elections, right? 2020 is an election year, God help us, uh, it is. And so a lot of the news coverage is about the presidential election. And it's understandable that Washington, D.C. looms very large in our understanding of the way politics affects our lives. Um, however, that's only one layer of government over you, right? And it's important to also know who your representatives at the state level are, uh, both in Washington, D.C. and in Jefferson City. And it's also important to know about your local elected officials. Um, this one right here, USA.gov slash elected officials is a really good way of knowing how to contact your elected officials. Okay, So you can contact the White House if you want. You can find your US senators, your US representatives, your state elected officials. So let's say, I don't know who my state elected officials are. Who represents me in Jefferson City? Right? Because there's going to be two people. There's going to be your state representative and your state senator. So let's find out who represents me. So I click, who are my state legislators? I click that. I click my state. I click find my legislator. And boom. Very good. So my Missouri senator is Bill White, and my Missouri representative is Lane Roberts, and my congressional representative in Washington is Billy Long. Right? So if I click here, Bill White, it gets me his contact information. One of the things that I think is really important as a citizen is to be in touch with your congressmen and your representatives um, by simply calling their offices and letting them know your opinion on issues. Believe it or not, that actually makes a difference. If their office gets absolutely flooded with calls on issues, it may affect the way the representative votes on a piece of legislation. Not in all cases. Not in all cases, right? Some issues are just very partisan. There are some issues in which a Republican is just never not gonna vote this or that way and other issues in which a Democrat is just never not gonna vote this or that way. But there are some issues in which it's clear when somebody's on a fence, right? And you can call their office and leave a voicemail or leave a message with whoever answers the phone. And I know that the generation of people in college right now is a generation that hates talking on the phone, right? We, young people, 
don't want to answer phones, they don't want to talk on the phone, they'd rather send a text. But I promise you, if you call the office of one of these people, the person you talk to is not gonna argue, they're not gonna talk back, they are simply going to write down in a spreadsheet, probably, your opinion on this or that issue. They'll say thank you very much and they'll hang up. So calling these representatives office and calling these senators offices is a low risk proposition and at the very least you're making your voice heard uh, in their office. And it may make a difference on certain issues. Um, the other thing that I think is important to know is that even more than Jefferson City, and certainly more than Washington, D.C., the, the elected officials that may have the most impact on our lives are the local elected officials, right? Fact is, if you live in Joplin, the streets you drive on, the rates you pay for water, electricity, gas, in some cases, the rates you pay for internet, um, the police that you might have to call, the firemen that you might have to call if there's an emergency, those people are under the control of the local elected officials, right? And so in terms of our day-to-day -day experiences, the kinds of things we're likely to run into in terms of governance, in terms of living our lives, most of that stuff is a local issue. And that's a little bit ironic because um, local elections have the lowest turnout of all, right? Whenever there's a local election that does not take place on the same day, as a state or a national election, nobody votes. People just don't come out, right? Less than 10% of the eligible voters typically vote in local elections. And yet, the people getting voted for in those elections are the people who maybe have the most tangible day-to-day -day impact on our lives. And the margins of victory are often in the uh, double digits. Triple digits, very commonly. Double digits, quite often, sometimes even the single digits. Right? In a town the size of Joplin, a serious get out the vote effort by a local candidate, even among just a couple hundred people, is likely to make a difference. Um, and speaking of which, coming up in April, there is an election for Joplin city government taking place. And it's going to be one of those elections where most people don't come out and vote. Because it's not an election with Donald Trump on the ticket or somebody challenging Donald Trump. It's not seen as in important in the same way. But I think in terms of our day-to-day -day lives, it's just as important, if not more so. So there's a candidate forum coming up this Wednesday. Do you live in Joplin? Okay, well, there you go. So at Unity Church in Joplin on Jackson Avenue, there is a forum for the city council candidates at 6 p.m. It's free, you can show up, you can ask questions, you can simply just listen to what they have to say. Right? Um, and I think it's an important way of getting educated about local issues. Speaking of which, I think another good thing, uh, another thing that I would recommend as a good citizenship move, right? Something that is good for being a good citizen is subscribing to the local newspaper of wherever you live. And for us, that's the Joplin Globe. The Joplin Globe is a seven days a week paper, which believe it or not, for a city the size of Joplin is now increasingly rare. I'm actually kind of surprised that the Joplin Globe is still a seven days a week paper. Um, the town I grew up in is bigger than Joplin, is actually wealthier than Joplin in terms of you know, per capita income, but its paper went from seven days down to three days a week. And that's happening all over the country. Um, and local media, I think, is extremely important. Because, for example, like, just like I said, right? Local issues, local elected officials, local government affects our daily life probably more than national government does in many cases. Who's gonna hold those people responsible if they get up to shady stuff, right? If there's no local news outlets with professional reporters dedicated to knowing what's going on in a town the size of Joplin, who is gonna catch the Joplin city government when they try to do something shady? Who is gonna catch a local business when they're dumping toxic chemicals into a river? Who is gonna have the time and the resources to follow up on that kind of stuff? And I think in places where there is no local paper, the answer is nobody, right? In places where there's no local paper, uh, businesses and local elected officials can get away with whatever they want. Not only that, but the lack of news about local issues has an effect 
upon the people, uh, upon the citizens who live there. Um, there's a recent report, this is actually an article in the Joplin Globe, there was a recent report by uh, uh, an academic journal called the Journal of Communications that showed that as local newspapers decline, communities become increasingly partisan. So what that means is, in the towns where there's no longer any local newspaper, the citizens in that town become much more staunchly Republican or Democrat. You get fewer people in the middle and more people on the extremes of the political spectrum. So local newspapers have a mediating and sort of a calming effect upon people's partisan passions. Um, at, to quote this article, if the information we get about politics is reduced to national party politics, the local issues that affect us most will be neglected by voters and politicians alike. Right? They've also found that um, in cities with no local newspaper or local media, fewer people run for office. So fewer people are involved in politics at the local level. Also, um, in towns with the towns without a newspaper are more likely to have polluting businesses located there than towns with a newspaper. Right? So that's just a you know a clear example of what I was talking about. Um, and so this was sort of a call to action for me as I was putting together this talk. I thought, you know what? It is high time I finally subscribe to the Joplin Globe. So I'll confess. I was not a subscriber to the Joplin Globe until just the other day because I was like, I have been meaning to do this for so long. It's high time I did it. Right? Um, and local news media depends upon subscribers. Right? They can sell ads, and that's how they make some of their revenue, but they also really depend upon subscribers. Um, now, the Joplin Globe question. Um, I was just going to make a statement. If you can't afford the Job and Globe subscription because you're on a tight budget, yep. you can at least read it in the library. We do have a subscription, and we get two copies a day. There you go. You can come to the library and figure out what's going on that way. Right? Absolutely. And the library pays for it, so it's still being supported. Um, now, another thing that's going on is local TV. And I think that local TV stations and the local news broadcasts can also play a really important role in keeping people up to date on what's going on locally. But you've got to watch out for local TV stations. Because the fact of the matter is, TV stations across the country are increasingly being gobbled up by huge media conglomerates. Um, there is a news media, there's a uh, broadcasting company called the Sinclair Broadcast Group, which now owns 193 local TV stations around the country. And so that means that every one of these local TV stations around the country, a portion of their local news broadcast is dedicated to what is called must runs, which are segments that Sinclair Broadcast Group tells them they have to show on TV. And those are often highly partisan in nature. Just take a look at this next video I'm gonna show. So this is, there's like layers of irony here at play because 
Um, on the one hand, that's a segment about how you need to make sure that the news reports you're seeing are legitimate and not fake. But on the other hand, what's kind of chilling about that is that is a segment that was in dozens and dozens and dozens of local group news programs around the country. And in every case, the anchors on screen were giving this report as though it was something that just their station was putting out as like a public service campaign. But in fact, it was a script that came down from Anaheim. And I think it's true that people have a lot of questions about the news in terms of, okay, well, who owns the news, right? Who is programming the message that's coming out, right? Because at the, at the end of the day, news companies are businesses, most of them. And they've got to make a bottom line. And at some level, there's going to be a person at the top directing the news making uh, priorities. And in the case of Sinclair, they put these sort of politically biased uh, opinion pieces into all these local news programs around the country, even though they're not actually made locally. So let's take the example of the Joplin Globe. This, I'm gonna, I'll skip to the chase. The, I'm not gonna conclude here that the Joplin Globe is not trustworthy. I actually think the Joplin Globe is a very good paper. But let's just think of an example. Well, how can we figure out who owns the Joplin Globe, right? Well, we can go to Wikipedia for things like this, right? Not that saying that Wikipedia is the be all end all of research, but does the Joplin Globe have a paper, have a Wikipedia website? It does, right? So the owner is CNHI LLC. Now, what is CNHI LLC? No idea, so let's find out. CNHI, Community, Com Community Newspaper Holdings, Inc., is an American publisher of newspapers <clears throat> formed in 1997. They own several dozen newspapers, for example, these. The company is financed by and is a subsidiary of the Retirement Systems of Alabama. Okay. This is weird, right? Public employees in the state of Alabama get pensions, and their pensions are drawn from a massive fund, a gigantic pot of money and holdings and investments that is used to generate profits that can pay retirees in the state of Alabama. The Alabama Pension Fund owns the Joplin Globe. The Joplin Globe, as well as many other small newspapers, are assets owned by the Alabama retirement system which is weird, right? But is that problematic? Does this create a, a conflict of interest? Does this make us question the reliability of the Joplin Globe? In this case, I would say probably not. And let me explain my reasoning. A pension fund, it just needs to make additional money for the pensioners in that state, right? The pension fund of Alabama just needs to keep growing at a small pace so that Alabama state employees can continue to draw their pension. So it's just trying to make money. And it doesn't really care that much necessarily how that money is made as long as it's made, okay? So I think that that isn't necessarily the most concerning thing to own the job and Globe, right? It's a somewhat neutral owner in my opinion. On the other hand, right, if the Joplin Globe was owned by uh, a company that drills fossil fuels, or that uh, does fracking in Oklahoma. There's a potential conflict of interest because fracking in Oklahoma is subject to a variety of different critiques for environmental safety and human safety. We get uh, earthquakes in Joplin sometimes that you can feel because of the fracking in Oklahoma. And the Joplin Globe uh, reports on northeastern Oklahoma, right? Northeastern Oklahoma is very much in the region of, that the Joplin Globe reports on. Right? So there's a potential conflict of interest I think that is important to look out for. Um, another factor to keep in mind is, in my opinion, and I say this as a historian, no outlet is truly neutral. I think absolute total neutrality is impossible. Anybody who writes a report, anybody who presents an opinion has biases. Right? 
Um, and it's impossible to remove bias completely. We're not robots. We're human beings. We're the sum total of our experiences. So how can you know if you're looking at a story from the national news, what are some signs in that story that it's unbiased, or at the very least, an attempt to remove bias has been made? How would you know? More research in it. OK, so if, if the story literally lays out its sources, OK, that's one of my, what else? Anything else you can think of? I'm basically myself. I don't have any set list of things to look for, honestly. So sources should be listed. Um, sources should be named. On the other hand, journalism has always relied upon anonymous sources. Why? <coughs> why, are an anonym, why are anonymous sources an important part of journalism? Very good, because the fear of retaliation, right? The fear of retaliation is something that most people in most lines of work live with, right? There are secrets um, that if you divulge them, you will get fired, right? Sometimes people also want to remain anonymous to protect their colleagues and friends. And so anonymous sources are a part of journalism, and they always have been, and they always will be. But most journalists, if they are good journalists, try to verify information from anonymous sources with other sources. Okay, so that's another thing to look for in, in, news, in news reporting that you're reading. They should tell you what their sources are, or if those sources are anonymous, uh, they will try to verify. Right? They will try to verify. Um, a major uh, one way that I think is one um, I think good sign for any news outlet at all is does a print edition exist and I know that we're entering into the age of online in which print editions are, are rarer and rarer but if a newspaper has a print edition it means that they have the infrastructure of a legit newspaper it means they have editors and the job of the editors is to make sure what they're printing is accurate okay so if an organization has both reporters and editors what that means is the truth of that information is the um, two people's job are, are, are at stake for the truth of that information. The person who wrote the story and the editor above the person who wrote that story. So the more people that are side, sort of professionally putting their reputations on the line for the truth of the story is perhaps a good sign that story is true, right? At least it's a, it's a, it's a sign in the right direction. Um, one thing that's happening in my home state of Michigan is a whole bunch of new local news sources are starting to pop up, which are in fact fake. They are um, news outlets that are named after small and medium-sized cities in Michigan. Many of them are cities that don't have a local paper or have a local paper that re re recently closed, okay? And they've got names like the Kalamazoo Journal, my hometown is Kalamazoo, right? The Mid Michigan B and things that sound like you know old timey newspapers, but they don't have any print edition. And all they are is they are outlets which up, sort of masquerade as local news. All they do is pump out um, stories with a particular political bias and make it appear as though it's local news, right? But if you were to come across one of those stories. One thing that should you know, make you raise your eyebrow and make you take a second look is, well, this thing doesn't have a print edition at all. right? This doesn't exist as a legitimate newspaper anywhere. It's only this website. Some of the, really, uh, some of the websites that are very notorious for spreading false information, they, um, they don't even put the name of the author on the article that they publish. Right? A lot of websites will publish an article, and there's no author name. Right? Then there's the problem of social media. Um, Twitter, Facebook, 
two of the most popular social media outlets, are two of the most common ways people get their news these days. Right? A very large percentage of Americans report that their primary news source is Facebook. Articles that somebody posted on Facebook. Here's the thing. That's bad. I'm going to say it right here. I think it's bad. And the reason I think it's bad is because of the way Facebook works. Right? When you go to, do you have a Facebook account? Mm -hmm. Okay. When you go to Facebook and look at your news feed, you are not seeing everything that your friends have posted. You are seeing Facebook's curated, uh, bespoke list of things that Facebook thinks you want to see. Okay? There's an algorithm at play. There's a mathematical formula for how Facebook chooses what to show you. And here's the problem. The main factor which makes it likely you're going to see a news article is not the truth of the article, not even necessarily who posted it, but how many comments is it, is it getting? How many interactions is it generating with other people on Facebook? Okay, and what studies have shown is the articles that get most interacted with and are therefore most likely to be shown to you on your social media are the ones that people are commenting on because they're saying, this is fake, this is not true. And so it's this vicious cycle. If someone posts an article on Facebook that's made up, and a lot of people go on there to say, hey, this is made up, that, those number of comments makes it actually more likely that thing is gonna get seen by more people and spread more, right? So if you can, my recommendation to you is um, use Facebook for pictures of kids and kittens and life events, but don't use it for getting your news. Find news outlets that you like. Um, every news outlet can be criticized for one re reason or another for having some bias, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's bad news. News institutions that have editors, that have a print edition, in which sources are named, in which sources are corroborated, must be relied upon because we have to have a shared set of facts for this democracy to work, right? Nowadays, you can choose uh, whatever facts you want to fit your worldview, and it's easy to do that. We fall into that pattern, right? I have my political opinions. I have my social views. I like it. It feels good to me when I see articles that reinforce my opinions and my social views, but I'm doing myself and I'm doing my society a disservice, I think, if I only seek those out. Right. It's hard. There's no magic formula for knowing precisely how to get real correct news. It takes work, but I think the work is extremely important because I think democracy and citizenship doesn't work without that. I'm done. That's all I had to say. Question? So for contacting your uh, representatives, Yep. Um, is there any kind of like script that you can think of or any kind of uh, way to word what you're trying to say? That's a good question. I should have thought of that. That's a really good question. So what I would say is let's say there is a um, bill under consideration by Congress or there's an ongoing issue in the news. What I would do is I would say, I would call up and when the person answers you'd say, hello, I am a constituent who lives in Joplin and I would like to give my opinion about whatever the issue is, right? I'm a constituent who lives in Joplin and I would like to give my opinion about the impeachment trial. Or I would like to give my opinion about the bill about medical marijuana that is currently under consideration, right? And then the person on the other, on the other end of the phone is probably gonna say, okay, go ahead. And you would simply say, I'm in favor of and I would like the congressman or the congresswoman to also be in favor of this thing, because I think it's very important. And you could give a reason for why you have the opinion you do, or you could just say that I want the congressman or the congresswoman to vote this or that way. And they'll write that down, they'll make a note of it, and they keep those numbers, and they report those numbers back to the congressman or the congresswoman themselves. Um, it's not always gonna change their mind, right? It's not always gonna change their mind. If, if uh, just to take a local example, if 10,000 people called Billy Long's office because they wanted a uh, more firearms restrictions, he wouldn't do it, right? There are certain opinions that 
our congressmen or congresswomen won't change. But on those issues that are controversial, especially those, those votes where they might, they might pay a political cost for being wrong or for being unpopular, that's where I think our influence is important. Is yeah. That, is that because uh, uh, the state is not handled through, directly through the congressman, but instead through the senator? Is that, is that why? In some cases. So it depends. There are some. Um, so the way it goes, whenever a law is made, the legislation, the proposal for a new law, originates either in the Senate or the House of Representatives. That's true at the state level or the federal level, right? And so if if a bill is under consideration by the Senate, you should call your state senator or U.S. senator. If a bill is under consideration by the House, you should call the, the House or the, the, your, your state house or your or U.S. Congress. Um, even in that case, though, I think they'll still make a note of it. Even if you've called the wrong representative, they'll still make a note of it and they'll still record your opinion. Because chances are, if the state house is taking up a bill the state senate knows about that bill and also has an opinion on it. They're also they're tracking it. Any other questions? Um, I guess I have a good question. Like, so if there's something that's uh, like a hot button issue, you could say, um, like let's say abortion mm -hmm. uh, or like gun control or whatever. Yep. Like, with the in these cases, if <clears throat> in the as far as the state side, mm -hmm. well, I'll just kind of exclude the federal side for a minute. Right. But but as far as getting like the state, how many did you discuss how many days it would normally take for it to for it to all be processed to become a law? Yeah, to become a law. That's a good question. That's honestly a better question for one of my colleagues who's a political scientist, like Dr. Delahanty or Dr. Shope. It depends. Um, it has a lot to do. I would say that depends on um, the governor to a certain degree. Because if there's a piece of legislation that the governor really wants passed, he or she is gonna put pressure on the other members of his or her party in the legislature to move that through quickly. Um, it also is up to the chair of the committees, right? So for example, um, a legislation about gun control, for example, that would probably begin in, I don't know, what committee would that begin in? That would probably have to come out of something like uh, a judiciary committee or something like that, something that deals with the criminal code. And the chairpersons of those committees, the, 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 the member of Congress with a lot of seniority that gets to be the chair of that committee, they have a lot of control over how long they let that, they sit on that thing. Um, and so I think it can vary widely from case to case. It really can vary widely. Um, and especially at the state level, I mean, state legislatures are not, uh, they are not immune to doing some sh shenanigans, right? They may move a bill through late at night without much warning. If they know that they have a majority of votes that they need for it, they may try to do it under the cover of darkness if they know it's going to be something that's politically unpopular. And in that case, it's hard to do anything about it, except vote for the other guy the next time an election comes around. There was a few years ago where a representative that we've mentioned in here uh, switched his vote at the very last minute after swearing up and down he was going to vote a certain way. Yeah. And it was basically a, a deciding vote for our state. Mm -hmm. So, and it was literally like, I think an hour before, whereas like for days he said he would vote the other way. Yeah. So it's happened. Yeah, you can't, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the election where they're really held accountable. The system we have is one where, short of a recall, does Missouri have recall? I don't know if all states have it, but some states have a mechanism called recall, where an elected official, if enough people vote to do this, can actually be recalled before their term is over. If they do something so bad, but it's a real process. Um, first, you have to get like thousands of signatures from citizens, from voters, saying that you want to have a recall of the election. Then you've got to get, in some cases, a supermajority of people out 
to recall that, that person. So the fact is, most politicians, short of uh, something criminal, will finish out their term. And it's the next election where we have to hold them accountable for what they've done. Would that be, would that be done by the delegates or the lobbyists or, or whatever, or anybody else in the party, a special group? The recall? Yeah. No, recall would be a, up, it goes up to a special election. So if somebody gets, if there's enough signatures gathered to, to recall somebody, there's a special date set for an election. Sometimes it can be in the middle of the summer. Sometimes it coincides with another election if it's already scheduled. And everybody will vote on that. Um, for example, the governor of California, about 20 years ago, the governor of California got recalled. The voters in California held a special election to boot him out of office. And then somebody, uh, the lieutenant governor, took over. And then just a couple years later is when Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor of California. Oh, that's how that happened. Yep. He had been, he was a Republican, and the previous Democrat had been recalled, and so a lot of people had a bad taste in their mouth around the California Democratic Party, so that's why a Republican won in 2002 and became governor. Mm -hmm. Are there any deadlines to what happened? For the recall? For register. Oh, good question. In the state of Missouri, what you, said. If, are there voter registration deadlines? The answer is yes. Oh. In the state of Missouri, you have to register 27 days before an election. So if you wanted to vote in the city council election, which is coming up in April, you still can, but you should go ahead and register soon. So for example, if you go to vote.org and you go to There is a part of this which breaks it down. By state. Let's go to Missouri. Missouri voter registration rules. You have to be a citizen of the United States, be a resident of Missouri, you have to be at least 17 and a half. Um, you can't be on probation or parole after conviction of a felony. Um, you can't be under house arrest. You cannot be judged incapacitated. Um, but there is a. I see. So you have to register to vote for state and for federal. Or two if you register to vote, you'll, do be, you'll be doing both at once. 